Howdy, howdy, howdy. Um, welcome to uh, the first of what I hope to be many videos. Uh, in this first video, I'm going to be giving you a tour of my home studio, including my mic collection um, and some of my hardware gear. I'll be doing separate videos on software, um, some how-to tutorials as well as to how to set up uh, template mixes, how to you know, dial in snare sounds, things of that nature. Uh, I'll also do a separate video on my guitar collection and a pedal board and how I get some of the guitar tones that I get. I do want to give a shout out though to my good friend Johnny Walker uh, who inspired me to do this video by uh, putting one of his own for his own uh, home studio out there. So uh, I'll put the link to his video uh, down below. And without further ado, let's get into my home studio which I call Sound Room Studios. Okay, we'll start with the room treatment. So this room is 14 feet by 12 and a half feet, it has nine foot ceilings. So the first thing I needed to do when we moved in and I selected this to be the music room was to treat the room. And I went with Gick Acoustics, G-I-K Acoustics. Love those guys, highly recommend them. Starting on this back wall here, we have um, two bass traps. These are six inches thick um, and treated with rock wool, I believe on the inside. Um, they have two scatter plates on the outside so that when the sound hits it, it scatters, the bass gets absorbed. It doesn't reflect back to the mix position. Um, in the corner here, I have, uh, because I have nine foot ceilings, I had to build some custom bases at the bottom. We have floor to ceiling base traps in three of the corners. On each side wall, I have two two foot by four foot by six inch uh, sound reflection panels or sound absorption panels. On the front wall, I have um, two uh, corner base traps as well, floor to ceiling again. And then I have very thick, heavy duty uh, curtains in the front and wood blinds behind those to sort of absorb any sound coming off the back of the, of the monitor. And then on this side wall, there are two more panels. Um, you know, again, the two foot by four foot by uh, six inch uh, sound absorption panels. So next thing I'm gonna talk about is my mic collection. For a home studio, I probably have way too many mics, way more than I need, but it's better to have extra mics and not need them than to need them and not have them. Starting with uh, lower frequency mics that handle things like bass cabinets, kick drums, that sort of thing. I have two mics that handle those lower frequencies. The first is the Shure Beta 52A, great kick drum mic. The next mic that I have is an AKG D112. This is an excellent mic for kick drums as well. Works well on the inside and on the outside also. Toms, I have two uh, betas as well, two AKG betas. And no studio, home studio, will be complete without the old-fashioned trusty SM57, Shure SM57. Next, I have a matched pair of Rode NT5s. These are awesome mics. Um, good condenser mics, great on hi-hats, great on overheads. Super good on acoustics. Next, I have a matched pair. I've actually got two of these. A matched pair of Carvin C12 clones. Um, these mics are really good on vocals, good on overheads, uh, also good on acoustics, um, and quite heavy. These are good, uh, quite heavy mics. These are tube mics, tube condensers, large diaphragm, great sounding mics. Next, this is one of my favorite mics, particularly for vocals. It's a Rode K2 tube mic. This is a, uh, again, made in Australia, phenomenal mic. I've had this mic probably 12 years now, 12, 13, 14 years. This is a phenomenal mic for vocals. I love this particularly through a Ventec 573. Next, I have a AEA ribbon mic. This is a R84. I love this through the Triton S40, which we'll talk about when we get to the front end gear here shortly. Next, I have a matched pair of Slate ML2 uh, microphones. Um, these are great uh, modeling microphones. They model Warrior R R121s, R122s. Um, just, again, a really good mic. Next, I have this beauty. This is yet another Rode. I actually have two of these as well. This is my primary go-to mic when I'm tracking an, uh, an acoustic. Um, I, again, I have a matched pair of these. So I have two of those, um, and I will use these on body position, bridge position, neck body, um, it's a, a great mic for capturing acoustics. Okay, so next, one of my favorite mics, this is probably the one I use um, most, is the Slate M01. I've got all of the mic modeling options with that, with the software, through the uh, VMS-1 preamp, straight into a line input on the Apollo, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. And this is the second uh, ML2 mic. I mentioned earlier that I had a matched pair of those. I keep this here positioned in front of the Mesa 550. 
Um, I can also drop it down. I have a, a two amps down here at the bottom as well that I can pull out and mic when I need to mic different uh, different types. So I got a Fender Bassman 57 um, down below and uh, a small Bagheera that I can power soak down to a half watt and get a nice uh, dirty tone with it. But primarily I record with either this Mesa or with the Kemper. Uh, but I keep this position here because when I'm recording and I want to work fast, all I've got to do is pull the cable out of the ML one that I use for vocals and pop it into here and I'm off to uh, I'm off to the races. And then lastly I have the trusty SM7B. Uh, this is a great mic. Um, I can use it for vocals. I can use it to mic an acoustic if I want to pop it down here. Um, and my daughter has a podcast, Atypical 20s uh, is the name of the podcast and she uh, does all her recording for her podcast from this room. So this uh, you know, using the Pro Tools rig. So this is uh, a setup that works both for her podcast as well as my tracking, writing, and recording process. As mentioned earlier, I have a Kemper amp, profiling amp. Um, it's uh, super, it's getting loaded with a bunch of profiles of a lot of different amps. So it basically is any kind of amp I want it to be. It can have a 67 Plexi. I can have uh, a nice 65 uh, Princeton, whatever I want to have with that. So I do love using that. I also use a Mesa 550. Uh, it's got a power soap in the back so I can take it down to 5 watts. I think I typically keep it at 50 um, and just run uh, floor um, on the clean channel and then run my uh, stomp boxes into that. This is my monitoring station. This allows me to give a headphone out um, for a vocalist who might be coming in to do vocal tracks for me. This also allows me to do speaker selections. Right now I have two uh, sets of speakers. I have small 5 inch JBLs and then Mackie MR8s. And this allows me to, uh, like I said, get, I can A, B them, I can run them in parallel. And then I have a third slot here for another set, which I believe I'm going to probably invest in some Focals next. I think we'll start at the bottom and work our way up the rack, over and then back down. Um, so uh, at the bottom of the rack, which you can't see at the bottom of the rack, are uh, drawers. This is a custom built desk. Um, down here at the bottom of the rack, I have an API lunchbox with rack ears. Uh, the lunchbox I believe came from Sweetwater. The rack ears I believe I got from Vintage King. Um, right now I have two slots filled. I have a Ventec 573, which is a Neve clone. And then I have a Lindell preamp with a Poltec style EQ. Moving up, I've got a headphone amp. I do have a, a ton of different handphones. I have Sennheisers, I have uh, Bayer Dynamic. Um, these are my favorites, the DT770 Pros. I power those with this, uh, with this Oz Audio HR4. Um, and then I loop out of that into this so I can feed a headphone mix, a separate headphone mix over to a vocalist. Moving up the rack, I've got a pair of um, XLR patch bays. I have uh, Old Faithful here. This is a Avalon 737 channel strip. Uh, it's got a pristine, super clean uh, front end preamp. Um, it has a really good EQ and a compressor on it as well. Moving up, I've got a uh, power supply, a lighted power supply that I can use. And then on top of that, I have an, an Ashley 572 uh, EQ. This is a seven band uh, stereo EQ. Um, so if I need to do some, custom, uh, some some carving of tone going in or signal going in, I can do that with this. On top of that is my uh, Focusrite liquid channel. Um, they don't make those anymore, uh, but they're good modelers uh, of different preamps and different front ends. On top of that, I have my interface. This is my Apollo. This is, a, I believe, a duo, um, core duo. It does have the Firewire card in the back of it. Uh, which I use to power the, mo the monitor and, and a few other things we'll get to in a moment. I've had this for a few years. It is uh, very reliable, very solid. I love it. It's got great uh, preamps, a lot of routing input output options, um, and I can get custom headphone cue mixes um, for different musicians if I need to. Next up from there is my 6176 by Universal Audio. Um, you're going to find out I'm a UA fan of a lot of their gear. It's got a 610 um, preamp on the left side and on the right side it's got the very well known uh, 1176 compressor, that's the 6176. I have a Trident S40. Uh, this is a channel strip that came out of a Trident console. Uh, Trident consoles I believe were built in England uh, and this particular one uh, came out of a console that I believe that the Eagles recorded their first two records on. So. Um, that is a phenomenal piece. Up from there is a TT patch bay that I had uh, Mr. Patch Bay out of Dallas, Texas. 
uh, custom wire for me. Um, it's got XLRs coming out the back so that I can connect pretty much everything I need to connect and just jump it from the front. Moving up from there on the monitor side, I've got uh, on the outside JBLs, those are small reference monitors. Um, I don't mix to those, I just sort of check and mix against them. My primary are the uh, Mackie MR8s. I've had them probably six, seven years. So we are now at the center part of, of my uh, recording setup here, what I would call my console because of the Raven. Um, kind of working our way up here, we'll start. I've got a um, Native Instruments Complete uh, 61 key keyboard. Um, and I use this to trigger any of the software samples that I need to trigger. I just put that on a desk, uh, a tray that I can slide in and out when I need to slide it in and out, keep it out of my way. Underneath is uh, the pedal board that I use for my guitar amp. Again, I want everything to be you know, quickly, easily accessible so I can work fast and efficiently. Working our way up here to the left, right below the SM7B, you can see that I have the Slate VMS-1. Uh, that is a uh, very transparent mic preamp. Um, it goes XLR out to a um, TRS quarter inch input that goes to the back of the Apollo. I have it, I think, wired up to line eight. Uh, by keeping it in a line signal, it keeps that, uh, that signal transparent, which allows you to take full advantage of all the mic models that you have in your software. In the center there, you'll see that I have a Mac, an iMac um, computer that I run my Pro Tools rig off of. Um, just below that computer is the Raven MTI-1. This is the first generation um, touchscreen mixer. Um, I absolutely love this. Um, I've had it since they first launched, so it's very reliable. I know he's uh, Slate's now um, doing the MTX and the MTI-2. Um, so if that one ever does give up the ghost on me, I will be staying with the, the Slate Ravens and going with the MTI-2. We'll probably just uh, bite the bullet and go with the MTX. Moving to the right side of the rack, um, this is the least used part of my studio. There's uh, just a couple of pieces in here that I rely on fairly heavily, but for the most part, um, this is just fillers, <laughs> filler equipment. Um, so that as I grow, I'll pull stuff out and add um, you know, the, the pull tech EQ that I really want to add, probably an LA2A to the side as well. But we'll start at the top and work our way down. Of course, we have the Furman power supply that powers everything on this side. Uh, I have two power supplies on each side of the console to power the upper half of the rack and the speakers and then to power the, the lower half of the rack. I've got a space filler there below that. Um, this is more nostalgic. I don't think I've used this thing in probably 12 years, but I have the O2, the Digi 002 rack. Below that, I have a Persona Studio channel. Below that, I have a quarter inch, 32-point uh, quarter inch patch bay. Moving down, I got a space filler, and then I have two keyboard rack modules. So I don't use the, uh, the Korg 03R or the JB880 very often, but if I'm going for more vintage 80s, 90s type uh, sound, I do reach for those on occasion. Moving down, I got another spacer. After the spacer, I have a Digitech valve. Uh, this is a guitar effect processor. It was made in the 80s, and it still sounds great. Moving down, I have the Rack Rider, um, which is, um, again, a power supply for the lower half of the rack. Um, next down from that, I have a, uh, a Mesa rectifier uh, recording amp, guitar amp. Um, so this is wired into the back as well. Moving down from that, another vintage guitar piece is a GSP 2101. Moving down from there, I have a Rack 11. This is a, digi a, a, a Pro Tools or an Avid Rack. Below that, I have a uh, Joe Meek um, a channel strip as well. Uh, this is really good on bass guitars. Um, you can you can use it for a number of different applications. All right, that wraps up the tour for uh, the Sound Room Studios, my little home studio here. I do want to thank you for tuning in. And by the way, if you if there's any particular piece of gear that you saw today that you liked, comment on it below. If you want a, uh, a more detailed explanation of any piece of gear that I talked about today. Let me know that by commenting down below. And also, if you have gear that you like, that you really love, that you're passionate about, comment down below on that. I might pick up that piece and do an in-depth uh, video on it as well. Thanks. See you next time.